Welcome to the first of seven videos that will review acid base theory. This essential introductory review will define an acid and base, demonstrate autoionization of water to develop the pH scale, introduce Kw to explore proton and hydroxide concentrations, and introduce many other essential background concepts. To understand acid base theory, one has to understand water. So let's begin by reviewing some basic concepts regarding aqueous solutions. To better our understanding of water, let's fold the two-dimensional Lewis diagram of water into three dimensions by deducing that the central oxygen atom is sp3 hybridized. Once the 3D diagram is completed, we can place the individual dipoles that arise due to the differences of electronegativity values and then add them to afford the net dipole as shown. Thus, it may be simpler to think of water as a bunch of polar mini-magnets that give rise to these very strong attractions called hydrogen bonding. This very dynamic system is in constant motion, and these attractions can be so strong that sometimes when these water molecules collide, one of the water molecules can take a proton from another water molecule, as shown, which will afford the hydronium cation and the hydroxide anion in a one-to-one -one molar ratio called the autoionization of water. This equilibrium can be expressed via the law of mass action, or commonly called the law of equilibrium, which is shown here in its generic form. But remember, pure liquids and solids are not included in these equilibriums. Thus, we can cancel water from the equilibrium expression, and we can simplify the hydronium ion as simply a proton. The final equilibrium is called the ion product constant for water, or Kw and it is the product of the concentrations of protons and hydroxide ions, which are both 1 times 10 to the minus 7 for pure water at 25 degrees Celsius. Now we can define a neutral solution when proton and hydroxide ion concentrations are equal. An acidic solution, as a solution that has the proton concentration greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7, and a basic solution as a solution that has hydroxide ion concentration greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7. But their product must always be 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Thus, in acidic solutions, the proton concentration goes up and the hydroxide concentration goes down. And in basic solutions, the hydroxide ion concentration goes up and the proton concentration goes down so that their products are always 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So let's work a few examples to review the Kw expression and calculate the proton and hydroxide concentrations. For A, the proton concentration is given. Thus, we first rearrange our Kw expression, then plug in the given proton concentration to solve for hydroxide ion concentration. Using the same type of problem-solving strategy for B, we are able to easily obtain the proton concentration. So how do the concentrations of proton and hydroxides change? Arrhenius defined an acid as a proton donor and a base as a hydroxide donor, but a more widely used definition has been put forth by Bronsted and Lowry, which says an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. In this context, it may help to think of a base as anything that increases the concentration of hydroxides. Within the autoionization of water, water can act like an acid, a proton donor, and a base, a proton acceptor, and this is termed amphoteric, acting like both an acid and base. In the next example, HCl is the acid, the proton donor, and water is the base, the proton acceptor. They form an acid conjugate base pair and a base conjugate acid pair. The extent of ionization is directly proportional to the stability of the conjugate base. Thus, for a strong acid, it may help to think of the conjugate base as being stable or low in energy, unreactive, and you will often hear it referred to as simply a weak conjugate base. The strong acid equilibrium will lie far to the right approximately 100% associated, and the equilibrium is often simply written with just an arrow, while a weak acid equilibrium does not lie far to the right, and a dynamic equilibrium is established due to the unstable conjugate base wanting to take steps towards stability back towards reactants. 
These differences in acid dissociation constants, Ka, that measure the extent of dissociation for weak acids are discussed in detail in part three of our acid base reviews. In addition, it may help to visualize the difference in dissociation between a strong and weak acid via a bar graph. For a strong acid, there is essentially 100% dissociation and no reactants left. And for a weak acid, there is quite a bit of reactant present at equilibrium. In the next few examples, we are charged with writing equilibriums and identifying the acid, base, conjugate acid, and conjugate base, as well as the acid conjugate base and base conjugate acid pairs. First, write out all reactants and products. Second, identify the acid, base, conjugate acid, and conjugate base. And finally, label the acid conjugate base and base conjugate acid pairs. Note for the first and second equilibrium, water acts like a proton acceptor in the forward direction, like a base. And for the third equilibrium, water acts like a proton donor in the forward direction, like an acid. Here again, we see water acting like an acid or a base, or an amphoteric substance. In the next example, we are again asked to write the equilibrium and label the various reactants and products. But here it may help to visualize the two-dimensional Lewis structure of the protonated methylamine. Here we see that in the forward direction, methyl ammonium is a proton donor, and in the reverse direction, the neutral methylamine acts like a weak base, establishing an equilibrium. As mentioned earlier, acid strength is proportional to conjugate base stability. So let's compare stabilities of conjugate bases and see if we can predict which acid will be the stronger acid. When comparing the stabilities of the conjugate bases for acetic acid and trifluoroacetic acid, we see that both conjugate bases have the ability to stabilize the anion via resonance, indicated via double-ended arrow in brackets, which we can imagine as the hybrid structure on the right-hand side of the diagram two partial double bonds within the carbonyl moiety. However, only the trifluoroacetate conjugate base has the ability to stabilize the anion by electron withdrawing inductive effects due to the more electronegative fluorine atoms via the sigma bond framework, indicated by the red arrows. Thus, trifluoroacetic acid is going to be the stronger acid due to the trifluoroacetate conjugate base being more stable when compared to acetate. An alternative approach to explain why trifluoroacetic acid is stronger is to identify that the OH bond is weaker within trifluoroacetic acid due to the electron withdrawing inductive effects of the three fluorine atoms. Thus, the bond is easier to break more protons can be donated to solution, and therefore trifluoroacetic acid is the stronger acid. In the next example, we will predict if sulfuric acid or sulfurous acid is the stronger acid. So let's simply compare stabilities of the conjugate bases. Both the hydrogen sulfate anion and the hydrogen sulfite anion can be stabilized by electron withdrawing inductive effects from the more electronegative oxygen atoms via the sigma bond framework which are indicated by the red arrows. However, hydrogen sulfate has three oxygen atoms, and hydrogen sulfite only has two oxygen atoms to stabilize the conjugate base. Thus, hydrogen sulfate will be more stable, which equates to sulfuric acid being the stronger acid. In addition, the extra oxygen atom will help stabilize the conjugate base by the extra resonance contributor available. If the beginning student has not learned about resonance contributors yet, then simply imagine if a negative charge can be distributed over more oxygen atoms, then it will be more stable. Alternatively, one could say sulfuric acid has more electron withdrawing oxygen atoms, and therefore the OH bond of the reactant is weaker within sulfuric acid due to the electron withdrawing inductive effects of the three oxygens. Thus, the OH bond of sulfuric acid is easier to break, which means more protons in solution.
Let's continue our introduction of a base, which, as we mentioned earlier, is anything that increases the concentration of hydroxides. If we assume complete dissociation of the ionic compound MOH when dissolved in water, in other words, equilibrium will lie far to the right, then we can represent this by simply using an arrow to demonstrate 100% dissociation, which is our definition of a strong base. M can be an alkali metal or alkali earth metal. Which are the most common strong bases? For example, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and calcium hydroxide, which completely dissociate, indicating that the conjugate acid of the strong base is stable and unreactive. Thus, the equilibrium will lie far to the right or completely dissociated. On the other hand, if a weak base affords an unstable conjugate acid, then it will attempt to take steps towards stability, which means going back to reactants and establishing an equilibrium. For a weak base, assume MOH is only partially dissociated, which establishes an equilibrium, and this equilibrium can be far to the left. For example, magnesium hydroxide. However, most weak bases that chemists use in the laboratory are amines, such as ammonia, which react with water, increasing the hydroxide ion concentration. It may help to visualize the 2D Lewis structures of ammonia reacting with water to better see how the hydroxide ion is formed. By definition, a weak base has an unstable conjugate acid, or often termed a strong conjugate acid, and wants to take steps towards stability. And the protonated amine, ammonium, in this example, will want to go back to reactants. It is now worth our efforts to explore the pH scale, which is another common way concentrations of acids and bases are expressed. It is common knowledge that if a solution is neutral, its pH is expressed as pH 7, or one would say the pH is equal to 7. But where does the scale originate from? To answer this question, let's recall the autoionization of water equilibrium and recall that the concentrations of hydronium ion or simply the proton concentration, and the hydroxide ion concentrations are both 1 times 10 to the minus 7 for pure water at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, if we express the proton concentration as 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar, most people will not even know what you are talking about. So chemists decided to express this concentration in a much easier way. By simply taking the negative log of the proton concentration, we get the value 7. Thus, at pH 7, the proton and hydroxide concentrations are equal and therefore neutral. Recall previously we learned that in an acidic solution, the concentration of protons increases and the concentration of hydroxides decreases, and vice versa for basic solutions. But remember, the product must always equal 1 times 10 to the minus 14, which was the Kw for water. So let's examine an acidic solution by increasing the concentration of protons to 1 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. Taking the negative log of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 molar affords a pH of 6, which means any pH lower than 7 is acidic. Increasing this concentration by an order of magnitude each time drops the pH by one unit as shown. Thus, with each incremental move of one pH unit away from pH 7, we are increasing the concentration of protons by a factor of 10. For example, when comparing pH 7 to pH 4, the concentration of protons has increased three orders of magnitude, or a thousand times, and the hydroxide ion concentration has decreased three orders of magnitude. In other words, a change of three pH units equates to three orders of magnitude change in concentration. Now let's increase the hydroxide ion concentration by an order of magnitude or by 10 times when compared to neutral pH, which will decrease the concentration of protons by the same amount. Taking the negative log of 1 times 10 to the minus 8 yields a pH of 8. Thus, any pH greater than 7 is considered basic because hydroxide ion concentration is now greater than proton concentration. If we know the concentration of protons, we have demonstrated that we can calculate the pH. 
and knowing our log rules, we can also calculate the proton concentration given the pH. So let's work an example. If the proton concentration is 0.18 molar, what is the pH? When taking the negative log of 0.18, the answer will read 0.744727 on and on and on within your calculator. So how do we deal with significant figures of log operations? Simply stated, the number of sig figs within the number you are taking the log of, in this case two sig figs, must be the same number of sig figs after the decimal point within your final answer. Thus, two sig figs after the decimal point. It should be noted that this problem could have been worded differently, but still solved in the same manner. For example, the wording could have been, what is the pH of a 0.18 molar hydrochloric acid solution? Well, because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, it will be completely dissociated. Thus, the proton concentration will be 0.18 molar, which allows the same problem-solving strategy. Alternatively, we could have been given the pH of a solution, pH 0.74, and asked, what is the proton concentration? Well, using our knowledge of log rules, the concentration of protons can be readily calculated as shown here. In the next example, we are given the concentration of hydroxide and asked for the pH. Well, first we convert the hydroxide to proton concentration using our KW expression. Then we can take the negative log of the proton concentration to get our final pH. Notice that within our final answer, we have three sig figs after the decimal point because we took the log of three sig figs. Again, it should be noted that this problem could have been worded differently, but still solved in the same manner. For example, the wording could have been, uh, what is the pH of a 1.82 times 10 to the minus 5 molar sodium hydroxide solution? Because sodium hydroxide is a strong base, it will be completely dissociated. Thus, the hydroxide concentration will be 1.82 times 10 to the minus 5 molar, which allows the same problem-solving strategy. Summarizing what we have learned so far, we can convert between proton and hydroxide concentration by the previously derived equation for Kw, and if we take the negative log of the proton concentration, we can get the pH. Similarly, if we take the negative log of the hydroxide concentration, we will yield the pOH. So now let's derive our final relationship between pH and pOH. Starting with the KW expression, we will take the negative log of both sides. Then substituting values in for pure water gives the final expression 14 equals pH plus pOH. Thus, if pH is known, pOH can be calculated, and if pOH is known, pH can be calculated. Thus, our rectangle is complete. The student should make sure that they can easily zip around the rectangle. For example, given the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to 5.92 times 10 to the minus 8 molar, one should be able to calculate the other three values on the corners of the rectangle. Using the KW expression, the proton concentration is deduced, followed by the pH after taking the negative log of the proton concentration. The pH is then subtracted from 14 to yield the pOH. Please take a moment to look over all the sig figs within each answer.